Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Humans and Wildlife Show. My name is Georgia Oteri, and I'm here today with my co-host, uh, Christian Sase, who's going to introduce our topic for the day. Oh, Christian, hang on a second. Um, we have a couple of comments saying that, a few comments saying that they can't hear that they don't have sound, which is strange because I can hear you. So can people hear me as well? Or um, if someone, could, these are from, these are all from Facebook, so I'm not sure. Um, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, just checking. So as you were saying, going on to our guests from OWL today. Um, oh, and I can't hear actually either of them. Maybe the sound is just a bit delayed today. Um, can you try introducing yourselves again? Ugh. Still no sound. So they're, they're not muted. That's interesting. Um, so, yeah, so I, again, they're saying like they can hear me, but not Christian. So, and this is interesting because I can hear Christian, but not our guests from OWL. Um, and everyone looks like they're unmuted. So the, um, I guess, I wonder, I'm just gonna try muting and unmuting both of you. So Christian, can you try saying something? Yeah, this is very unusual. And we have some people um, requesting the link who, who are watching it on Facebook and they're like, link. Oops. sorry about that. I'm trying to get the link to the other. Um, Rita says, try and refresh the studio. Still no sound from guests. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just try refreshing them. guests versus the people in the studio sometimes. Okay. 
it could be because I unplugged my stuff. Some, something could have happened, and I don't know why. Otherwise, I'm going to go in and out again. Yeah. So it yeah. would be if um, I'm just going to put this in the comment too, but it would be helpful uh, if anyone is listening and can hear this in the guests, if you would say who you can and can't hear, either myself, Georgia, okay, or Christian, no. or the guests from OWL. Um, yes. So what? Betty says she can hear me, I think, but if you can say like, okay. oh, I hear Georgia. Um, I hear and Christian, that's good. So Christian. Heather's her hearing me now, that's good because I changed my microphone to the front microphone. So I'm just gonna take this off. So I won't need this anymore. So, so that's good. That's good. I, I really have to change some things here. I, I think something is playing crazy. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna try and get everything right. No picture, yeah. So there is. So I just added yeah, the no, picture. Yeah, we have it. The picture is back, Georgia. It's all good. I, I think. Yeah, I think that. So, I'm just gonna add us all on the screen here. Yeah, and let's try and get David back on. Hopefully, and David and um, Rob are going to be back, but we can't hear them yet. Can um, hear or see us? I, I'm yeah, going to ask them to disconnect and reconnect themselves because that's the only thing everybody. I can see. Okay. I, I, yeah, I can hear the owl folks actually. Uh, you, you can hear them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I cannot hear them, but um, that's fine if you. Oh gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> wow. So yeah, multiple people are saying that they can okay. hear everyone now, but Christian, you can't hear. Yeah. Hi, hi, Kate. You can. You uh, can. Kate can say. Well, very nice to have Kate here. She says she can hear everyone. That's great. So, for some reason, I'm going to. I cannot hear them, which mm -hmm. is really weird, but... Um, um, so, Kristen, anyway. why don't maybe you just try refreshing, because when I did that, I could hear them again. Um, I will do that. Hang on. Yeah. And um, I'm going to turn on to private chat with Christian, hopefully, while we figure this out. But so maybe since the audience can hear you both now, could you please uh, introduce yourselves and just what are your names and what's the what organization are you with? Well, ding, 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 ding. Oh, sorry, that's the reunion bell. We're all leaving now for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing you. Um, well, David Hancock is my name. I'm with the Hancock Wildlife Foundation, the Eagle Biologist. And with me is Rob Hope, who's the, the managing director and, and the one person who knows all about birds of prey in the whole Northwest for making sure when they get in birds that have been somehow hurt or are not well, he gets them well and back conditioned so they can be released into the wild. And we know this for sure because we keep seeing the birds he's released nesting at our various nests. And the people who follow us, uh, Christian, over the years know I have about 600 nests that I follow. And we have had dozens of his released birds uh, appear to be nesting at, at our sites. So uh, Rob, Rob has done just a phenomenal job over these past years. And so Rob, um, go ahead. You say what you do here other than what I've said. <laughs> yeah, I'm Rob Hope. I'm the general manager here at OWL. Uh, we intake anywhere between 850 to 900 birds of prey a year. Uh, and we get them from all over the province, all different ages, all different types. Um, and basically we're a rehabilitation center here, which is uh, for the orphaned and the injured. And we uh, patch them up and get them back out. Wonderful. We started to do this particular program because I was down here the other day with my associate, Miles Lamont, and we were banding and putting a tracker on one of the birds from one of our downtown Vancouver nests, in fact, called the Vanier nest. And when at that point, uh, Rob was saying, oh, we would like to do a live broadcast and tell the world, because you people are out to a big hunk of the world, uh, what is happening here at the whole Northwest largest rehabilitation center. And one of the interesting needs that they have uh, got because of this heat wave, uh, they got more birds here than they have ever had before. So 
uh, that puts a lot of stress on a lot of resources. So we'll, we'll deal with that later. Um, do you want to tell us background of, of the bird that we were dealing with, the, the Vanier bird? Yeah, the, uh, the Vanier bird was, uh, was a young bird that uh, fell from its nest and was hiding in prickle bushes. Um, unfortunately, it was too young to fly at the time. And uh, one of the volunteers who volunteers with us, as well as David, uh, went and wrestled them out of the uh, prickle bushes, brought them here to the center. Uh, where we fed him up and got him into our flight pen to build up some muscle, and he was released not too long ago. Great. And for those of you who are not really familiar with the scientific jargon, prickle bush may be scientific. It's also called blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it turns out they, they got, I, I don't know, have we given a name to the Vanier bird? Does somebody know? I haven't heard one. We don't name them here. We no, just get we don't them numbers. Either. Yeah. <laughs> Some of, the, some of our people named them. Anyway, it's the Vanier bird, and it not only got to be in great flying condition here, but we took it down a couple of days ago and released it back near its nest site. And you're always worried when it first goes out of the cage, will it really show the strength that you think it's demonstrated previously in the flight cages? Will it do that in the wild? This bird flew about 550 yards over a whole bunch of big high trees, and disappeared down behind them. We didn't see where it went. It turns out it went and flew underneath one of the Vancouver City bridges and off into, uh, eventually that day, onto some people's ledges on the balconies of, of their high-rise apartments. So this bird is well on its way to being a, a, a world traveler. Oh, that's right, yeah. And uh, some of our birds that uh, have trackers on them, uh, we got one young bird a couple years ago uh, that was released here in South Surrey and within three days he was up in Bella, Bella Bella. So that just shows the strength and condition that they have before they're released. For the people watching our website, he's referring to our Surrey Reserve bird from last year. Um, uh, I guess it's something two. Um, I forgot. Eight of four. four. Eight, eight, yeah. yeah. Tracker something four. And if you go to our website, you'll be able to see where that bird is. And left No, we hadn't seen anything like this in such a short amount of time. Uh, our birds came again from all over the province. And in a period last year, between June 28th and July 2nd, we had 24 birds. And this year we had 111 birds <laughs> in that same time. And with the heat wave, a lot of the little guys were, you know, two, three weeks behind, unfortunately couldn't fly. And they had no option but to go to the ground, uh, leave their nests where uh, a lot were found and uh, picked up. Uh, especially for the young ones, they can't, uh, they can't escape the sun. Um, they're basically big uh, uh, sun shields. And what happens is they start to uh, overheat. Um, when the panting runs out, they're, of course, too young to fly to find water to cool down. And oftentimes, they only have one other option to try and cool down. And unfortunately, it's the one where they come out of the nest and come to the ground. Yeah. Oh, so we have a few people commenting that they can't hear you again, Christian. <laughs> I just wanted to say, so I don't um, know if you wanted to uh, try refreshing again. And um, I can ask, I was curious, so you said that because of this heat wave, you're getting record numbers of submissions, right? And you get, it sounds like you do a lot normally. You get a lot of animals in and you raise them up till they're healthy and then you track them to make sure that they're like going on to live like good lives and stuff and, and seeing what they're getting into. But but what does record number of submissions look like for you right now? Like how many are you getting? And, and also, um, and you know, is, is the type of submissions you're seeing now different because of the, because of the heat wave? Yeah, we, that, the, when we had the big, big heat wave here, um, that's when the numbers did skyrocket. 
uh, for about a four day period there. Uh, last year we had 24 birds and uh, this year we had 111 birds, uh, most of them being young. And in one day we had 19 birds admitted through the center. Uh, normally we average, you know, two to four a day. Um, and the, the biggest day we had was 19 in one day. That's, that's a lot of work. Wow. And so mostly, mostly young birds you mentioned. And is that, and I know a little bit because I've been watching Christian stuff, but can you explain to us why mostly um, young birds are being admitted because of the heat wave? Uh, most of them were young birds because normally this heat that we had doesn't hit until later on uh, in the month. And unfortunately, when this heat wave hit, the birds weren't fully fledged yet. So they had a really, really tough go, which is why the amount of young birds uh, upon admittance was so high. And, and also, just let me throw in this, birds have a great difficulty actually panting like we do. They will pant, their gruller pouch will uh, move in and out and help a bit, but they don't have a lot of surface skin through which they sweat, except in, inside the mouth and in their nose. So getting rid of this extra heat is really difficult for, for raptors. And so one of their challenges is on overheating, they, they just kind of begin to lose their mind because once the temperature goes above their own temperature, they can't lose any heat. They just rapidly begin to cook in their own juices, literally. I mean, at 40 degrees centigrade, protein begins to disintegrate and birds are already at 41 but they're panting and circulating their, their blood all the time to keep a bit cooler. But at 40 degrees, protein already begins to disintegrate. So if they can't keep the blood flowing and cooling them, uh, then they have fairly quick problems. And that's what they were experiencing here. The birds were getting too hot in the nest and as a desperation, they just jumped out. Uh, at least there was a momentary <laughs> movement of air over their that's right. Blood saturated wings where the the the, um, the sheaths are all full of blood. So they had a few moments until they hit the ground yep. when they were getting cool. But that would be it. And amongst amongst some of the young birds that we did receive, they were all still found on the ground with dead uh, siblings. So there was some that didn't make it, unfortunately. Yeah, and I've heard that like birds don't even um, pant really the way that they do. It's their, their method of quote unquote panting is a little bit less efficient than ours is. And I think that's what you were saying with the guter, uh, there's a, what's the term again, the official term? Well, they're, they have a guler pouch. They have that, their, their mouth tissue when they open their mouth and pant uh, is also has a few less feathers below the chin than when they open them up. So it, it's almost like having a bit, a bit of bare skin, it's at least bare on the inside, not greatly bare on the outside. So they have this great difficulty of getting rid of air. Now, it makes good sense. If you think of a bird, as soon as he wants to get cool, he just goes up and flies. And there's lots of air mo moving past all his parts. And he can cool off pretty quickly. Or he can fly to water where he can get an extra drink. But, of course, in a hot nest, none of that is available to a young bird. They just sit there and cook. And many nests in the city area, many, many of the eagle nests, have no overhead protection simply because there are not a great variety of trees. And so the eagles don't get to choose uh, from enough branch options to put the nest below where there would be shade offered to the chicks. So they're sitting right out in the heat the whole time. Now, as Rob pointed out, normally that works out okay. They've balanced their time for nesting to get full size and out of the nest by the time our real hot weather comes in August, they're already gone and they've headed to Alaska by then. But this year, our heat wave came uh, in, in June, right Late at the June. beginning. Yeah. yeah. So it was a real challenge for the biology of these eagles. They've evolved the method of helping to get around our August heat wave by being full sized and flying by then, and they just fly out of the country. But these birds, quite got that big. That's right, yeah, this year uh, during that heat wave, we received 55 merlins, 53 bald eaglets, and uh, 10 young Cooper's hawks in that time frame. Wow.
<laughs> uh, in other years, we wouldn't be seeing that number this uh, uh, that rapidly. Uh, we are getting some young birds in with like even today. Um, a lot of the young birds that are out uh, flying around now learning the ropes are hitting windows and cars. So we are seeing, uh, you know, a few of those uh, will be coming in over the next few weeks. And um, thank you so much for some more comments saying that uh, poor Christian is uh, being muted. But th thankfully, we can I think people can still understand from uh, context a little of the answers what he's what he's asking about there. So thank you so much. Um, so but yeah, if we can maybe we can try to repeat the question uh, after Christian asks it in the in the answer. Um, so I'm curious when you when you get these juvenile um raptors like what does that look like because what, from what i understand like if they're too hot right they're going to either die in the nest or they'll like go over the edge and die so the the juveniles that you were able to save is it like people calling in when they see babies in a nest that look hot and you like go up and, and get them from the nest or or sort of at no. what stage do you get these juveniles from no we don't go into the nest to take young ones all the mm -hmm. uh, all the young ones were found on grounds underneath their nests um, some of those nests could be 60, 70 feet high, so it's quite a drop. Um, a few of the, the ones we received, it was actually a dead sibling that uh, got people's interest where they would find the live ones not five feet from them huddled up against a tree. I see. So they don't necessarily die from the fall, and those are the ones that you're able well, to help. Uh, Georgia, many of them have already got half to two-thirds grown wing feathers. See? And the longer the wing feather is, the greater their flight direct trajectory from jumping off the nest to hitting the ground. So it becomes, the longer the wings, the, the more gentle becomes their descent and, and their landing. That, that makes that's... a lot of sense, yeah. So they're kind of maybe like flapping down or, or something like oh, that. Yeah, yeah. They are, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, Christian is just asking me to repeat that he put the link in the comments for the Owl um, Rehabilitation Center, and that also that there is um, a donate link so that you can donate to help support these, you know, much higher than number, higher than anticipated um, sort of rescue efforts that they're having to do this year. Um, and he just, Christian just put the comment in again. Um, and where can people donate at the link? Is that correct, Christian? Okay, they'll find it. Yeah, so if you go to the website, you can find the donate button there. And um, so, yeah, so what if people did donate to you, which we encourage them to do, um, What? how does that money help you out? Are you buying more equipment this year? Or? Uh, this, this year, it's actually been uh, our food bill has... Uh has gone up. Um, we've had to call in a few favors to get extra food at this time of year with all these birds. So our food costs has gone up uh, quite significantly in the last month, month and a half. Yeah, I imagine that could get quite expensive because you're feeding them. Um, yeah, they. I imagine that we all know baby birds eat a lot. They're growing and they, they have kind of specialized, uh, different specialized diets and stuff that they need, I imagine. Yeah, here at the center, we buy all our food, our mice, our rats, and our quail. When they're in care, they get the best food possible. Um, and that uh, that's why the, you know, it's not free. Oh, so Christian was just commenting and, um, you know, they mentioned that they've had some food donations and uh, that you were mentioning that David bought a, brought a hundred pounds, donated a hundred pounds of salmon. Uh, where, where did those salmon come from? How does one get so much salmon, like from the grocery store? You, know, you go out and well, it? <laughs> Actually, we, we donated 500 pounds. They're still going through it. I think they've gone through about 250 pounds. And so they've got yeah. another 250 pounds. But we're not, yeah. So, so we get that salmon uh, from some of the native fisheries when they misprocessed them. They got a little bit of freezer burn, um, 
the ones I donated to uh, to Owl this year were actually all wonderful fillets. They're basically uh, sockeye fillets that I noticed in the local store they were going for like $27 a pound but uh, these ones were a little bit freezer so the eagles got quite a delicacy um, that a lot of people would be rather envious of it but uh, it worked out very well we had it as bait that we were using for trapping and banding uh, more of the eagles so it seemed there was a greater need here um, in fact we're now shifted our banding operation to banding a bunch of their birds and putting trackers on like a uh, Christian began to talk about it before we did, and Christian interrupted, I guess it was, that we had this one that was at the Surrey Reserve, which is on our website, that they raised last year after it hit a power pole, came to the ground, got brought to Owl. A few days later, we let it go. We put bands on, but we also put a tracker. And two days, two days after putting that tracker on it, this bird had flown all the way up to the Alaska border at the mouth of the Stikine River. So this is a quite a, it's about 480 miles. So it did quite well for two days all on its own because it went by itself. The parents actually were still here uh, when that happened. So it was kind of, kind of interesting. So this year we're going to do a whole series of birds and we released the first one a couple of days ago, three days ago now at Owl. And it came from here as well. And it was from another one of the nests that we followed quite actively. So. Uh, we're now just going to put that bird onto the website to show where it's going so that people can follow it. Again, one of the birds released here from Owl. Okay, um, so yeah, so Christian is saying that he is going to introduce kind of this first video now. And I didn't quite catch all of it, but it's um, a video of putting some trackers on birds. So it looks like they have a hood over the bird so that it can't see and it's not scared. Um, could, yeah, people oh, maybe okay. tell us what's going on here. Okay, okay. Oh, we don't? And it, yeah, yeah, what's, uh, what, what are we seeing in the video? Why not? We did, we did, we did. Oh, I see. Well, I'm, I can't see it anyway. I'm on this side. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. You're just like you're just like this bird. It, it can't see either. Um, Christian, what kind of bird is this again? This is a juvenile eagle. Okay. So Miles, who we see on the left side here in this video, which well, it's a pause now, he's um, adding a tracker on to the back of the bird. So in between its, its wings there on the back, um, that way that they can, um, they're gonna be able to follow this bird and see where it goes to. Um, I see it close, <laughs> the intense scheduling happening on the white bird back there. So this is interesting to me. We do the same thing with um, bats. It's a similar position for the tracking, the tracker, getting it in between the shoulder blades, and that's, you know, a nice sturdy place to put it where it also doesn't interfere with their with their flight too much or their movement of their limbs. Miles. Yep. So we're gonna rewatch that first video again. If there's anything. Uh, Georgia, um, mm -hmm. I can comment on it because we're looking at your live broadcast on another monitor here. So I'll okay, comment. yes, yeah. If you'd like to comment, that would be great. Yeah. So th this is the the Vanier Eagle, the young chick that we just released. Um, it's the one that fell out of the nest probably a day or two before it should have. It was here in at Owl for about how long? A week? Uh, it was here no days? longer than that. Probably yeah, probably closer to two weeks. Yeah. closer to two weeks yeah and it was flying very strongly we took some photos i'm not sure if christian's going to show them or not but i took photos of it here in the big flight cage uh on the day or two before 
before. And Rob said, oh, no, that bird's good and strong. It could be going now. And so that's when uh, Miles and I came down and put the tracker on. Um, and then we released it the, uh, two days later. We left the tracker on it for a bit more flight exercise and analyzing that the tracker was working properly. And, um, and we released it right at its nest site. And it flew incredibly strong. Always a great test of how well the bird is doing is what happens when it bolts out of that door of the cage. Is it going to stand around and look bewildered or is it going to take to the air? And this bird just took to the air, flew about five, six hundred meters, and then it just disappeared behind a line of trees. We couldn't see where it went, but it turns out it dove down um, underneath the what is called the um, the Burrard Street Bridge. And apparently it landed on a on a fence post there. And then it went over and landed on a lady's balcony of, of her I think it was the 12th story building. And, and so um, it was looking in her window and she came out and shushed it off. And uh, it's been around the Vancouver area for the last two and a half, three days. And we expect in the next two or three days, if it does what's normal, it will leave the area because it'll be getting hungrier and hungrier. And it will probably go north. That's what we anticipate. Go north, young man. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's so, great. But, and so this is an example of a, one of the individuals that has uh, survived thanks to your organization, whereas it wouldn't have, without your help, um, survived this kind of devastating heat wave that's going on in the in the northwestern um, in Western North America right now. And so just so people in the audience know, I just added the link again, if you want to donate to help these animals, help buy them food and stuff like that. Um, we have a question from Kit Harvey. How long does the tracker last? Well, the last tracker, the one we put on the bird in South Surrey, it's been going all last year, and it's just about a year today or the last week or this week that we put that tracker on. The uh, Another bird, which we're going to release in the next few days here with a tracker, we have, I caught the adult male, the, the dad of this bird, just over two years ago, and it's been wearing a tracker for two years and uh, showing us every day where it goes, where it goes to feed, and so on. So they will last, hopefully, three or four years. Now, are these solar solar trackers, I take it? They have a solar uh, charger on them. That's correct. Mm -hmm. They're, they speak to us via cell phones. Each one has its own cell phone number, like your kids do, um, and uh, our kids eagles all have their own cell phone number and we can dial it up and say kind of report home every hour or every six hours if we think it's in good bright sunlight we could get a, a signal every hour if it's in dull areas uh, overcast where it doesn't get much recharging on the solar panel then they may only have enough power to send a signal once a day or every two days so we can call it up and say change the signal uh, transmission even on the days they don't do a transmission to us of where they are, they are recording in their little data bank on their back all the locations at the time we've asked them to. So if they don't even report in for a month for some reason because they're out of cell range, they're still recording all these uh, GPS points. And as soon as they hit a cell phone uh, signal, they download all last month's data to us. So it's quite, quite amazing how much data we're able to get on where we go. That sounds Are really fascinating. And Christian now? is um, sharing another video with us now of um, a flight cage and a bird with a tracker. And uh, yeah, so this looks like the flight cage here where we're looking at with what I presume is an, an adult bald eagle and a Juvenile bald eagle? Yes, Christian's nodding at me, okay. Yeah, so that cage that you're showing, that's our flight pen here at the center. Uh, so. It's 120 feet long with an 80 foot pool that's full of live rainbow trout. And it gives the, it's for eagles and ospreys mm -hmm. and it gives them enough uh, flight space that they can fly and build up their strength. And if they feel like going for and Owen, I see that we're zoomed in on the um, tracker on its back right now, so we can see the little solar panels and stuff. 
Um, wow, that's so cool. We lost you for a second, um, David. Yeah, the enclosure is cool. It's it's neat to see them in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Apologies. We're having a lot of audio problems. We've lost. Um, we've lost David and our folks at Owl. I don't know if they want to try joining and reconnecting and. Um, Christian is here with us as well, although also apparently inaudible to most of you, but, um, and I, the least knowledgeable person on birds here, um, I'm the one you've got, you're left with. So, but that is really cool to see. I'm always a little bit envious, um, you know, with these, these solar panel trackers are cool, but they're also a little bit heavy. So you can't use them on a lot of um, really small animals even uh, you can use them on birds much smaller than this but there is a, a size limitation with the solar tracking so hopefully as technology advances our, our wildlife uh, our wildlife tracking capacities will also continue to increase yeah. Um, yeah, I, ca I can't hear, I can't, I can only hear Christian. I can't hear, um, I can't hear them. Um, perhaps Christian is there. Oh, I think we've gone through all of the video, the videos now. Um, you know what, maybe what I'll do right now is we can actually go and take a look at the OWL website and maybe, in, and Christian and, and other folks, if you want to try to refresh or rejoin, um, because some people have also commented that they've had uh, problems uh, using the links that we posted. So I'll just go ahead and share and we can look at the, the OWL website together. Um, oh, Chris, let me just pull up my screen here. And take away these things. Everything decided to come. Okay, so wow, you've got uh, you've got a lot going on now. So, um, so if you weren't able to find it before, this is the the owl website, the the place where um, where all this great raptor rehab stuff is happening. It looks like a whole complex here that we've got, and so that explains some of those big, beautiful flight cages that we just saw. Um, so, if you Google orphaned wildlife rehabilitation, um, this should come up. And um, this is it's a nonprofit that helps take care of raptors, and they're experiencing a huge, huge influx this year because of the heat waves out in Western North America. And if we look on their website here, we can see, um, we can learn about the different dangers to raptors. So domestic animals, habitat loss, electrocution, lead poisoning, rat poisoning. We notice like all of these um, different types of, of threats are types of things that we talk about on the Humans and Wildlife show. We can see um, we've got a bird stuck in a car here. I've, I've heard from folks at other wildlife rehab places that um, sometimes you, you can pull these birds out and they're actually alive still and can be saved. Um, so if you do hit a bird and it, a raptor and it's like this, um, don't despair, call you know, a wildlife rehab person and you might um, you might be able to, to protect them still. They might make it. Um, so we can learn about different threats on their website. We can learn about the different education programs that they have. Um, they have some virtual education um, um, offerings as well as on-site. It looks like they probably, you know, travel with some animal like ambassadors that help um, educate people about this species, their species and raptors. Um, yeah, these videos are super cool. I was just checking back on the comments real quick. And uh, let's see. And of course, one of the things that we're trying to encourage with this presentation is checking out the ways to help this wildlife rehab place. And so, um, you know, they do have, uh, looks like opportunities for some in-person volunteering. But for most of us, um, the ways that we can help are to donate. So they have some membership options. Um, you can sponsor a raptor. And um, also you can do your part by learning about the different threats to raptors so that you don't inadvertently contribute 
to um, to harming of these wonderful animals. Um, so that's about it. They got some news and events and stuff like that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and see if we have sound perhaps from Christian or other folks. Yeah, so I think Christian has, um, if I could you know, convey his regards, um, of course, we realize that most of you can't hear Christian, but given all of the technical difficulties that we seem to be having today, um, we are going to go ahead and just call it a wrap. And so thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for coming and hearing about, you know, these cool animals and, you know, the, um, the, the, events on the West Coast and stuff that are leading to this sort of huge influx of animals need, needing help. So that's it for today. Um, we hope to see you all next week when we are um, going to be talking about eating insects. So a very different type of human wildlife interaction. But join us at this time next week, Wednesday at four. Subscribe to Christian and myself wherever you're watching from. And thank you for joining.